She opens up this, this world that's, that's um, sacramental, you know, that everything, everything is, is sacramental. There, there's no separation between, between the sacred and the profane. She was one of the most compelling Catholic figures of the 20th century. Dorothy Day, activist, pacifist, tireless advocate for the poor. Known for co-founding the Catholic Worker in New York, Dorothy's charismatic message would quickly reach across the globe. Now, her cause for canonization opened, Kate Hennessy, her youngest grandchild, has made a remarkable contribution to the story. An unprecedented and intimate look at Dorothy Day, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty, today on Subject Matters. Kate, so much has been written about your beloved grandmother, Dorothy Day, and you felt that you needed to add another layer to what has already been written, but tell us about that, that layer that you're adding to the story with this remarkable book. I think there's more than one layer. Um, certainly what I, I wanted to do was tell the story of my grandmother as a mother and as a grandmother. Um, I think that, the, that we were in danger of losing that, that element of her in this whole process of, um, you know, she is, she's well known. She's becoming more and more well known. She's um, in the process of being examined for canonization. And what happens often with, with these kind of, um, these processes and, and, and this kind of um, adulation, or sometimes uh, the opposite of that, is that um, people are, are narrowed down. They're simplified. And um, I really felt that this would be, it would be a huge loss to not have the story of her as a, as a woman, as a mother. Um, so, and also I want to tell the story of my mother because she was a, a, an essential part of this. My, my grandmother converted to Catholicism after the birth of my mother. I mean, it was that birth that really um, changed her, that, that focused her, that made her decide to, to, to commit on this path. In the early 90s, your mom handed you a stack of folders with uh, a whole bunch of letters in them, letters that your grandmother had written to your grandfather, Forrester. And how did that, when you first looked at those letters, because I think they hadn't been read for, so, for some years before that, but when you first, your first encounter with those letters, what, what came out and how did that uh, you know, add to this whole unfolding story? Well, it's interesting. The first time my mother handed me those letters, as you said, it was in the um, early 90s. She had found them in, in her father's apartment after his death in 1984 and um, just held on to them. And then she just started kind of slowly handing them out. And when she gave them to me, I actually couldn't read them because I felt like I was peering into uh, uh, an intimacy that wasn't mine to look at. Um, so I kind of just said, uh, no, mom, I can't read these. And, um, and then she just kept talking about them. And I started to realize that there was something so important to her in these letters that um, if I wanted to understand her, I'd better sit down and read them. And um, when I finally did, it was, uh, so much made sense to me, just how, I mean, it was hard for the three of them. When, when my grandmother started the Catholic Worker, when she became Catholic, um, when she wanted to marry Foster, my, my grandfather, and these things, created tension between the two of them. It was a, a, a terrible, terribly painful experience for the three of them. And so I think my, my mother just felt um, this, this sense of healing to be able to see her mother as she remembered her um, as a young child, you know, just this, this very passionate, very um, funny, um, very acerbic woman. You mentioned that so much of the book is about this relationship between your grandmother and your mother, um, and it really is profound. And going back to when your mother was first a kid, it wasn't easy for her, was it, to be the, the daughter of Dorothy Day? No, it was not easy. Uh, she was eight years old when the Catholic Worker started, seven to eight, and um, immediately, almost immediately, my grandmother became quite well known. 
it was the nuns actually that really you know, noticed her um, and started inviting her to speak. And so she became quite, I mean, it took off like, like wildfire. The, the paper started with 2,500 issues in May of 1933, and by 1936, it was 160,000. There was, there was one issue of 190,000. I mean, it, was, it really was quite extraordinary how quickly the whole thing just took off. I mean, people were just, their imaginations were, were you know, set on fire. And um, so people would come and they would say to my mother, so are you going to follow your mother's footsteps? And my mother was a very different person. I mean, even from a young child, she knew that she was very different from her mother, very much. Even though she was born and raised in New York City, she was, um, knew that she wanted to live in the country, knew that she wanted to, to ha have animals and, and um, do the whole farming thing. And so this idea of, of becoming a, a writer and a talker and a public person just horrified her. So it was quite difficult for her to kind of um, deal with those expectations. The Catholic Worker, as you mentioned, really took off, and, and a lot of people know it now. They recognize it uh, as an incredible movement of the 20th century. Um, a lot of people have their you know, various ways of thinking about it, but when you go back to when Dorothy and Peter Morin actually began it in 1933, what, what did they envision when they launched mm -hmm. this project? I don't think they envisioned what happened. Um, <laughs> certainly what, what my grandmother thought and latched onto was a newspaper. You know, she was a journalist. She'd been writing um, in journalism since she was 18. Uh, she knew how to make up a paper. She was quite experienced in all these things. And so when she met Peter Morin, who was the one who introduced her to the um, social teachings of the Catholic Church, before then she didn't know of these things. Um, and when, when they got together, he said, you know, let's publish something. She heard, let's publish a newspaper in which she would do all the writing. And uh, basically what he was saying is, publish my writings. <laughs> um, and so there was a little bit of a difference in the beginning, but that's all they thought. That's all they thought they were doing, is they were just um, bringing information to people, saying that the, the, the church has a program of social action. And of course, when you start talking about these things, immediately, people in need show up and say, well, you're talking about this. Another thing is that Peter Morin wanted the bishops to open houses of hospitality. He, you know, he wasn't saying that, that they open one, it should be the bishops. Right. Um, but um, when you have people showing up on your, at your, you know, your doorstep saying, I'm homeless, and of course in 1933, it was the height of the, the Great Depression. I mean, there were millions of people out of work and homeless in New York City alone. Mm -hmm. The um, upheaval of that time was just very hard to imagine. Um, so my grandmother being kind of the, the very practical person she is, said, okay, we have to start um, housing people. She started renting apartments, then they, you know, started a, a soup line. And, but she never meant that. Neither one of them ever meant that that was what they were going to do. It just was an, uh, a natural progression. It's so interesting to think of, of your grandmother and then your mother by, you know, association, so to speak, with your, with your grandmother being immersed in these groups of people, these houses that are packed with different people, especially as you mentioned in the height. Uh, but I know your grandmother also really appreciated being away from it all. She loved to go to the beach. She loved Staten Island. She loved the water, the sea, to be by the sea. Uh, tell me about that. What drew her out there? I think she, she received her spiritual sustenance from the water, from the sea. You know, Staten Island was where she joined the Catholic Church, is where she experienced her conversion. She had this wonderful little cottage right on the sea. And Staten Island is not one of your most beautiful places. I mean, it, it really is pretty basic, but there is beach and there's ocean. And um, with that, I think that um, she always felt, because of that beginning, she always felt that water was quite sacred. All water was sacred, um, even the, the abused water around Staten Island. Um, and she certainly, you know, it was hard work living at the Catholic Worker for 50 years or how many years she was, she was living at it. it. It was noisy, it was dirty, it was crowded, you know, it was a lot of people who would lose their minds, you know, it was, it was hard. And so she had to flee, you know, and she said whenever things, you know, get difficult, it's best to flee. Um, whenever she would get too cranky and ill-tempered, she would flee to, to the beach. It was uh, essential for her, I think, to keep her strength up, to keep going, to endure. 
We have to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll look at Dorothy Day's faith, how it influenced her life and her work, and how it impacted her family. Don't go anywhere. Kate Hennessy is a writer and the youngest of Dorothy Day's nine grandchildren. She attended New York University and the School for International Training in Vermont. She has traveled and worked around the world, including in the former USSR, in Guatemala, and in India. With photographer Vivian Cherry, she wrote Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker, The Miracle of Our Continuance, and her writing has appeared in Best American Travel Writing. Kate lives in Vermont with her husband. I could feel my grandmother over my shoulder as I write. How she hated it when people wrote about her, especially of those early years. What do you know of me, I hear her asking me. How many people have looked at her life, including herself, searching for the earliest signs and elusive elements of religious impulse, searching for that exact moment of conversion. I can see no separation, no tears in the fabric in any aspect of her life. It is all of one piece. We're back with Kate Hennessy discussing her book, Dorothy Day, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty, an Intimate Portrait of My Grandmother. And Kate, I want to go back to the early years in New York when Dorothy was a part of this anti-establishment group of youth. There were socialists and anarchists, uh, but they were poor, they were grungy, they went bar hopping, they were night crawlers. It was a, a really interesting time. So Dorothy had, you know, was a bit wild in her youth, you could say, but there was something really unique about her, and that was this religious strain that she had, that even though she wasn't raised uh, as a believer, she had a strong connection to the church. Tell me a little bit about that, where that came from. Yes, her parents were not um, religious, though they did give her some religious sensibilities. I would think it was her mother, my great-grandmother, who, um, who would say to her, God wills that all men be saved. And um, that was something that my grandmother, you know, remembered and repeated all through her life. Um, and her father, she used to say that her father would go around with a Bible under his arm, though she couldn't quite figure out why he was doing that. But um, so it's, it's, you know, it, it's hard to say that there was no religion, but certainly they weren't church-going people. Um, I think what happened, as far as we can tell anyway, what happened is that in, when she was nine years old in 1906, they were living, the family was living in San Francisco and they, the San Francisco earthquake happened, which was a, a tremendous um, uh, disaster. And um, I think she, she kind of, um, ha two things happened then. One is she had this um, deep awareness of God at that time. And then another thing that happened is that how everyone came together to help each other. That she was really quite um, impressed by when, when you have such a disaster, people turn into something else. They become good, they become you know, generous. Um, so those two things were quite influential on her. But she always, I mean, as you say, she had this religious strain. Um, it w you know, there was a, a, a several funny um, stories. One is that um, a very good friend of hers, you know, many of her friends were members of the Communist Party, and a very good friend of hers said that uh, a Dorothy will never be a good communist. She's far too religious. <laughs> so, you know, people knew this early on. Also, uh, you know, she, would, uh, she was known for cornering people at parties to talk about God. Mm. So, and these are, you know, these, as you say, these were people who were, they were radicals, they were bohemians, they were not, they were interested in breaking free of, of the old ways, and that included religion. But, you know, they accepted her. You know, they accepted that, that difference. Her very good friend, Mike Gold, who was a lifelong communist, um, recognized her religious impulses in the very, very beginning, you know, because she would invite people that were sleeping on benches to, you know, come into the to bars to have a, you know, a warm drink or, you know, a place to, to sleep that night. So, I mean, not, these, these people were watching her and, and, and I think not quite understanding her, but certainly um, sometimes understanding her. Mike Gold did actually understand her religious leanings because he came from an Orthodox Jewish, Jewish family. So, I mean, there was this kind of um, um, tension, but not really as much as, as uh, we like to think. I mean, and I think that's another element of her genius is that she could do anything and say anything, and people just accepted it, you know, just really supported her, never questioned what hmm. she was doing. But it was a, a 
not only a point of tension but even conflict right uh, uh, later on in her life with her with her family with your grandfather and with with your mother I'm thinking when she wanted to open the retreat house in Easton uh, as opposed to just continuing on as a, as a farm the farm that was there welcoming people and growing things so this whole thing her religiosity was also a source of conflict in the family and in the worker movement was it not yes it was um, the the conflict with my grandfather is a little bit more complicated than just one of religion I think he would have accepted her religion but she wanted to get married and he did not believe in marriage um, he and he never got married um, so he was he was very firm on that I mean I think that both of them were quite strong-willed people and they both were very concerned about not being hypocrites so uh, you know they, they just couldn't work things out I mean a lot has been made of the fact that um, and this is incorrect. There, you know, there's a narrative out there that says that he didn't like her religion, he left her. And that isn't what happened at all. Um, he just wouldn't marry her, and she ended the relationship several times. Mm -hmm. It takes a while to end these kind of things. In terms of the, um, the retreat, this was in the 40s. Um, my grandmother went through a very difficult time at, that, at that, those early years of the 40s for several reasons. One the Catholic worker was getting a reputation as being not quite correct in, in the Catholic world because of her stand of, on pacifism and her stand against World War II. It really created a, a lot of division within the worker and in, in the greater Catholic community. And I think she felt attacked. She was attacked um, by many levels. And at that time, she met um, Father John Hugo, who was this, um, who led these retreats that were very strict. Um, silence and um, six days of silence, um, though my mother didn't mind that at all as a teenager. But it was um, this idea that you give up everything. Anything that's good in your life, you give up. And um, my mother was just becoming a teenager. She was just beginning to, to learn what she liked in the world. She was just beginning to, to talk with her mother about about all the things that you know that uh, her mother loved literature art music I mean my grandmother loved all of these things all, all her life she had great appre appreciation of these things and then suddenly it was cut and um, and it was a very what my mother called it was a very severe and pious um, stage of my grandmother's life um, and it, that created problems also within the, the group of the Catholic workers because they felt this, this was too harsh, this was too strict, that, that really that people who are coming to the worker in need did not need this strictness, that they needed something that was much more compassionate. But they all just kind of waited for my grandmother to kind of move through this, this, this period, um, you know, understanding that she needed it to, to kind of support her in this very, very difficult time. As always, we have a guest reviewer of the show. Carol Lee Flinders is a writer and scholar, and here's her take on Kate's book on her grandmother. Carol. So I've known that this lovely book was in the works for several years now, and I couldn't wait to read it. But I have to say my wildest hopes for it were completely exceeded. Um, Kate Hennessy writes with a level of grace and assurance that are just astonishing. And that couldn't have been easy because the people she was writing about were complicated and intense and brilliant in ways that were very different from one another. And they struggled so hard in their lives. They struggled hard to find their way and they struggled to find ways to honor the love that they had for one another. Um, perhaps the parts of the book that were most revelatory for me concerned Tamar herself. Um, She's always, of course, been in the shadows. She wasn't a talker, and so it's wonderful to see her a fully realized, whip-smart, very funny woman. Um, a very poignant story. Perhaps my favorite passage, I think, was describing Kate as she's falling asleep at night, a little, little girl, and on the other side of a very thin wall, she can hear her mother and her grandmother talking, 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 on into the night. And the sweetness and, and warmth of that rise and fall of voices, it's like a contrapuntal lullaby, and she falls into it as she falls asleep. There are anthropologists that talk about something they call the granny advantage, and what it boils down to is that no matter where a child grows up, whether it's out on the Kalahari Desert or in the, um, you know, some uh, 
uh, urban sprawl, um, the best predictor of that child's well-being, mental, physical, emotional, is the nearby presence of the, grand, the, the, the maternal grandmother, uh, the mother's mother. It's marvelous to watch that play out in the life of Dorothy Day because you see, you know, there's these moments when Tamar and her brood are up snowbound in a, in a little rickety house up in Vermont and Dorothy's duking it out with the city bosses in New York and she gets the call, Mom, we need you. And boom, she delegates like crazy, jumps in one of these incredible clunkers and drives straight through up to Vermont and takes charge. Next minute she's turning out huge dinners, she's driving the kids to school on icy roads, she's hauling the boys to football practice and she's desperately trying to get them all to learn the catechism. I did come away with one question and I'll pose it now. Um, you were the ninth of these children and it fell to you one way or another to write this story. I'm wondering when you knew that you were going to be the person to write it up and what kind of response and help and encouragement might you have gotten from your siblings. Thanks so much for writing the book, Kate. Okay, thank you very much, Carol. Well, Kate, how did this enormous task fall to you, the youngest of the grandchildren, and how have your siblings responded and encouraged you in the process? Well, I think, first of all, I'm the only one foolish enough to take this on. Um, it, it is an enormous task. I mean, it took me seven years to write this book, and it was very painful to write. It's, it's not an easy story. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sadness in it. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of wounds, you know, certainly familial wounds. but. Um, I think what, why I took it on is that, well, for one, my mother and I spent years talking about her mother, so we really had built up this relationship over this that I think um, my other siblings didn't do so much. Um, also, I think, um, well, I'm the only writer in the family. I mean, some of my siblings do some writing, but I'm the only one kind of insistent enough to keep doing it. And, um, and then I was just driven by the need to do it that, you know, if I didn't write it, I wanted my mother to write it actually, you know, and I kept kind of bringing it up when she was alive, you have to write the story, you have to write the story. And she just said, no, I can't write the story. And I think she felt that it was impossible to write. It was just too complex, too um, um, paradoxical, too difficult. Um, and also she was always disappointed with, with how other people wrote about her mother and the Catholic worker. It just never seemed to grasp the, the, um, the elemental, the essential nature of the story. I mean, she loved the Catholic worker. She loved her mother. This whole history, she was, it was her history. Um, and so I think she kind of had, had lost hope that anyone could write it. And then she died. And I thought, well, if I don't write this, this, it will, this story will not be told. I have to write it. And, um, and I didn't know if I had the ability to do that. Uh, in terms of my siblings' support, they have been fabulous. I mean, they were supportive from the get-go when I said I'm doing this. Um, it was very important for me to have their approval. So they were my first readers, and I gave them the option to you know, take anything out that they didn't feel comfortable with. But they accepted it as it was. It was extraordinary. Well, it is a very beautiful book. Uh, we'll take one more quick break, but then we'll be back with some concluding remarks from Kate Hennessy. Dorothy Day, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty is published by Scribner, an imprint of Simon & Schuster, and is available for purchase at simonandschusterpublishing.com slash Scribner and at Ben McNally Books in Toronto. I dedicated the book to my mother, um, and this was really a no-brainer. Um, I wanted to tell her story, and but not only to tell her story, but also to tell the story of her mother in the way that she would approve of, and I hope she has approved of this book. Kate, as your mother was dying, you were with her, and at one point you posed her the big question, which I know everybody asks about your grandmother. Do you think your mother was a saint? How did your mother respond to that? She didn't say a word, <laughs> and that's her way. I mean, I didn't expect her to answer it. Um, and, and it kind of was like the devil in me asking her. You know, I just wanted to, you know, just see if she would respond. Um, what she did was laugh. She just laughed, and, um, and, you know, her eyes lit up. And so I think that the, 
the, the idea tickled her, and I think she also, I don't know, I can only speculate, because she didn't tell me. Um, but, you know, she knew exactly how powerful her mother was. I mean, she was an, my grandmother was an extraordinarily powerful woman, and my mother experienced that, saw that, saw her develop, saw the Catholic worker develop. I mean, she was, my mother was the first Catholic worker um, at the age of eight. Um, and really just saw this whole history unfold um, and so knew exactly the miracles that, that my grandmother has, has um, performed, you know, just by this, this extraordinary movement, the Catholic worker movement, and how much, uh, how much they have done, how much work that they have performed, the works of mercy. So I think, you know, in my mother's mind, there's no doubt um, that something, um, extraordinary is here, but she would never, ever say one way or the other, yes, she is, or no, she wasn't. Do you believe that she is a saint? Yes, I do believe she is a saint. What do you believe about holiness, or what do you, how, how has it changed your perception of holiness, knowing that, that someone who is saintly is a part of your family and is close to your family? It's an interesting question. I think I had to learn that someone in your family could be holy. I mean, I think it's kind of, um, we tend, certainly when I was growing up, in, in the culture I was growing up, um, there's kind of a tendency to, to denigrate, you know, to say, oh, you know, to say, you know, your grandmother's a saint is not a compliment, you know, it's, and so I think I kind of picked that up, that um, you can't find holiness in your own family, that doesn't make any sense. But then I actually over a period, it was actually India that kind of brought home that yes, there is holiness in your family, on your doorstep. I mean, certainly Hinduism believes that. And that kind of opened this up. Well, why, why not? And then um, I think why I, why I believe she's a saint, and this is very hard to articulate because this is, this is mystery. You know, we don't understand everything. We don't understand why or why are people the way they are, really? Why, why grace comes into our lives? I mean, this is all a, this is all a mystery. But for, for me, there's just this, um, she has been able to kind of ex open up. She opens up this, this world that's, that's um, sacramental, you know, that everything, everything is, is sacramental. There, there's no separation between between the sacred and the profane. I think that, that you know, there's this, this switch of perception that, that somehow all geniuses or artists, or, you know, that they, they lead us into this switch of perception. And um, she does that in so many ways. Okay, thank you very much for writing this book because it really, really is beautiful, very moving testament uh, to your grandmother. Uh, and the story lives on, obviously, in your family, but now we can all share in it, so thank you. Thank you. The book is Dorothy Day, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty, An Intimate Portrait of My Grandmother by Kate Hennessy. You can get it right here at Ben McNally Books in Toronto or online from Scribner, an imprint of Simon and & Schuster. Kate is also co-author of Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker, The Miracle of Our Continuance. And if you'd like to learn more about the Catholic Worker, you can visit their website, catholicworker.org. I want to thank our guest reviewer, Carol Lee Flinders. Carol is a writer and scholar and the author of Enduring Grace, Living Portraits of Seven Women Mystics, and Enduring Lives, Living Portraits of Women and Faith in Action. And remember, if you'd like to see my video review of Dorothy Day, The World Will Be Saved by Beauty, visit our website, saltandlighttv.org slash subject matters, and click on the episode page with Kate. That's all the time we have for today, but we'll see you again soon. Take care. Subject Matters with Sebastian Gomes is sponsored by the Cullen family. Our Salt and Light team works hard to bring you quality Catholic programming like Subject Matters. Please consider supporting our mission by making a donation today. Thank you for your generosity and remember our hope begins with you.